the design of planned attacks on buildings inside the U.S. and how operatives uh, were directed to carry them out. That is valuable information Who have the for those responsibility of us to protect the American people. He told us the operatives have been instructed to ensure that the explosives went off at a high po a point that was high enough to prevent people trapped above from escaping. He gave us information that helped uncover Al Qaeda cells' efforts to obtain biological weapons. This is Building 7, a 47-story skyscraper that fell on the afternoon of September 11. The government says that fire brought it down. However, 1,500 architects and engineers concluded it was a controlled demolition. Over 6,000 of my fellow service members have given their lives. And thousands of my fellow first responders are dying. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a structural engineer. I'm a New York City correction officer. I'm an Air Force pilot. I'm a father who lost his son. We're Americans. And we deserve... I lost my husband. My son. My uncle. My nephew. September 11, 2001. Most people don't know a third tower fell that day. The government says fire brought it down. The collapse of World Trade Center 7 was primarily due to fires. I, along with 1,400 other architects and engineers, have found the government's conclusion to be physically impossible. 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 We need the truth about what happened that day. Go to RememberBuilding7.org. Why it fell, why it matters, and what you ...neighbor from Frankfurt, Germany, to New York City, and they put him in charge of their friend company called Kuhn, and Loeb. Then they ganged up with other big players by investing in Rockefeller Oil, Harriman Railroads, Carnegie Steel, and Brown Brothers Investment Banking. By 1901, the Rothschilds had amassed $22.2 billion in U.S. assets. The mayor of New York, John Hyland, called them the invisible government, while Congressman Louis McFadden called them a dark crew of financial pirates who would slit a man's throat to get a dollar. When Woodrow Wilson became President of the United States in 1912, he sold out America. Wilson was backed by Jacob Schiff and Paul Warburg, who worked in the United States as German immigrant agents for the Rothschilds. In 1913, Paul Warburg rewrote the U.S. monopoly rules with the help of Senator Nelson Aldrich. They called the new rules the Federal Reserve Act. With President Woodrow Wilson's blessing, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank became a privately owned central bank, free of government control. The pirates divvied up the private stock in America's money supply and made Rothschild agent Paul Warburg head of the U.S. Federal Reserve. To collect their bounty, they also created the Income Tax Act and the hated IRS. With the stroke of President Wilson's treasonous pen, the banker gangsters became the Fed in 1913 and have owned a virtual monopoly over the U.S. economy and the taxpayers' money ever since. They can print money out of thin air, control treasury loans, and profit from interest rates. Since their biggest windfalls come from loan profits and weapons sales, wars and death are not only profitable, they're desirable and necessary. Today, American citizens owe these merchants of death approximately $70,000 per citizen.
und Bettchen und auf ihren Schultern tragen den deutschen Staat, das unverschrieben mit allen Adolf Hitler wasn't the only madman to rule over Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm II led Germany to its destruction in World War I. Crippled since birth with a useless arm, Kaiser Wilhelm was the grandson of Queen Victoria and the great uncle of today's Queen Elizabeth II. It was no accident that Kaiser Wilhelm chose Max Warburg as head of Germany's secret service. The Warburgs and the Rothschilds controlled Germany's central bank called the Reichsbank, which was founded by Mayor Rothschild. While Max and Felix Warburg helped finance Germany in World War I, their brother Paul Warburg of Kuhn and Loeb helped finance the American side by selling war bonds through the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. The Rothschild and Warburg printing presses worked tirelessly on both sides of the Atlantic, rolling out debt money. Germany won the First World War by 1916 without a single shot being fired on German soil. British convoys were blown out of the Atlantic by German subs, the French army mutinied, and the Russian army was defecting. With British Prime Minister Lloyd George up against a wall, Lionel Rothschild and the Jewish Zionists offered the British a deal they couldn't refuse. We'll bring the United States into the war as your ally and win the war for you, they said, if you'll promise us Palestine. In April of 1917, President Wilson got the green light and declared war on Germany. Because of overwhelming opposition to the war, Wilson invoked the draft and passed the Espionage Act, forcing Americans to fight or be thrown in jail. Billions of U.S. taxpayers' money was delivered to the British war machine, money that was never repaid. In return, the British government wrote the famous Balfour Declaration and addressed it to none other than Lord Lionel Rothschild. The Declaration promised Palestine and Israel to the Rothschild Zionists. The Zionists believe that they are entitled to the land of Israel because according to the Bible, Israel was promised to the Jews by God and according to the Bible, the Jews are God's chosen race of people a race favored by God above all others. In 1917, Lord Allenby conquered the Holy Land, and the Jews were promised the national home in Palestine by the Earl of Balfour, a policy endorsed by Woodrow Wilson and by the League of Nations, which made Palestine a British mandate. The Versailles Treaty negotiations after World War I were held behind closed doors at the luxurious private mansion of yet another Rothschild family member named Edmund Rothschild. Treaty negotiators included Rothschild agent Paul Warburg as a United States delegate and Paul's brother Max Warburg as a German delegate. <laughs> 